I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's program on the third generation and the Holocaust in film. We're very grateful to the Battery Park City Authority for the generous support of today's program and so much of what we do here at the museum. We're here to discuss the subject with three experts, each from a different perspective. Our moderator is Dr. Irit Felsen, a clinical psychologist and researcher and the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. Irit is an adjunct professor at Columbia University and Yeshiva University, a member of the American Academy of Experts on Traumatic Stress, and the co-chair of the Trauma Working Group in NGO Committee on Mental Health and Consultative Relationship with the United Nations. Welcome, Irit. Thank you, Ali. Alexa Karolinski is a German Jewish filmmaker and the granddaughter of survivors. In 2012, Alexa directed, produced, and edited the documentary Oma and Bella, which follows her grandmother Oma and her grandmother's best friend Bella, two very different women who share the trauma of the Holocaust. More recently, Alexa co-created, co-wrote, and produced the hit Netflix series Unorthodox. We hosted Alexa for a program last year called Inside Unorthodox, and we're honored to have her back. Welcome, Alexa. Hi. And last but not least, Noah Maimon is an Israeli filmmaker and actress. She made her directorial debut in 2010 with Oi Mama, which follows her grandmother Fira, a Holocaust survivor, as she tells of her escape from Europe with her caretaker and caretaker's daughter. Noah has also directed Homecoming and starred in Children of the Fall. Noah, we're glad to have you here. Welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you. As Irit, Alexa, and Noah explore uh, today's discussion, please feel free to share our questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the hour together. Without further ado, welcome again. Irit, feel free to get started. Thank you very much, Ari, and thank you, uh, Noah and Alexa, for joining us for this program. I'm so glad that we are finally able to do that after our uh, unexpected uh, thing that uh, caused a small delay in the program. So I will start by, by quoting my very close friend and mentor from uh, Yale University, Dori Laub, who was himself a child survivor of the Holocaust, who said that for us children of survivors, we viewed the world and view the world from the vantage point of a catastrophe that ravaged our family. That was the beginning for us the second generation, a certain awareness uh, from uh, very early on, from a time we cannot usually identify, where we knew and we were aware of the atrocities that our parents suffered and the loss of uh, our relatives, our extended family. 3G, which is your generation, have a very different experience. Uh, they did not, or you did not, um, ex you were not exposed to what another second generation, Thane Rosenbaum, called uh, secondhand smoke. You were not exposed to that secondhand smoke. You were not exposed to what uh, Yolanda Gempel, my colleague from Israel, calls the radioactive emission of the pain of the Holocaust in the from the from the survivor parents. And for you, the departure point is not so much that as it is the loss of connection to the little stories, the little uh, vignettes, the little facts. For you, the, the departure point is more the loss of the connection to the past and to the people that populated it. Um, so it's more about fragments that cannot be fragments in, in your way of life, in your character, in your looks that cannot be, uh, that, that cannot be connected with the people that our parents knew and, uh, and that are gone. So you created your documentaries, your two very different and very, very moving documentaries, which, uh, which are the center of this program and which I hope uh, people can view, those of the audience who haven't viewed them will be able to view them after our program. We will only show a very tiny, tiny short vignette of each as part of our uh, discussion. So Ari, if you wouldn't mind, uh, could you please show the vignette from Noah's um, documentary, please?
the grandchildren still scorches my soul. When he died, I was 11 years old, too young to take care of him at the hospital. But at the exact same time of his death, without knowing it, I felt an intolerable, sharp pain, like a knife stabbing the heart. But still, Granddad left this world with a smile on his face, surrounded by his two kids and wife, loved and hugged by his five grandchildren. I think that אולי, אבל אנחנו כאן עכשיו כולם, וטראומה היא רחוקה כבר. Stell dir vor, ich war noch nie hier und wohne so viele Jahre. Warst du schon hier spazieren? Warum nicht? Ich finde das wunderschön. Ich esse nur jüdisches Essen. Ich bin so geblieben, wie ich war. Alle sind ein bisschen modern geworden. Man isst alles. Ich nicht. Ich war zwölf Jahre, wo der Krieg ausgebrochen ist. Mit 14 Jahren war ich schon in Lager. Und 18 Jahre bin ich raus aus dem Lager. Wann sollte ich lernen? Welchen Stein wir angucken? und lesen, die alle Leute kennen hier. Alexa, komm mal her. Hast du schon so was Schönes gesehen? <lacht> weißt du, was mit du gehst? Crazy. A little bit crazy, a little bit. Lichtot, lichtot, lichheim. These are both such beautiful tributes to your grandmothers. Um, let's start with a question that I know Yuri has, um, which is to, to explore with each of you. When you set out to create these films, what was most important to you? Uh, uh, what, did you what were you hoping for in the outcome? Let's start with you, Alexa, and then go to Noah. Um, the question was, what did I hope the outcome to be? Yeah, what did you want to do with the film? Why did you set out to make it? Um, well, I made the film in context of studying uh, documentary filmmaking, and it was my thesis film. And um, I think, you know, the project at the time started as a cookbook, just because I couldn't cook. And I really wanted to preserve all their recipes and learn how to cook. And then that kind of started into me filming them a little bit as part of film school. And I, I showed people clips of them. And, you know, it's one thing if it's your own grandmother and it's another thing when you see other people react to the person you're shooting. And um, it, it just became really clear. I mean, first of all, that they love the camera, especially Bella, the woman with the gray hair. They really loved the camera and it, it, it sort of became the perfect vehicle to um, learn and, and capture and capture their story. And then the, the deeper reason is also because, you know, I grew up in Germany and it was really important for me, the idea that um, I always thought in school when we learned about the Holocaust and in Germany, you learn about it a lot, but it's of course, 
the grandchildren of mostly perpetrators. And if you're a Jew in, in school, you're one of very few, most likely. And um, I always felt that if people could meet my grandmother, there would be, they, they could feel closer to history, to, to our version of history, you know, to the one of the survivors and their, and their children. So I think partly I had this wish that people could, you know, meet them on a really, really human basic level and not through just what they went through and not just through the horrible things that happened to them, but actually also through, you know, some lightness and beauty and laughter and, you know, um, really approachable basically to others. Yeah, well, what about you? Um, well, when I started filming the movie, I wasn't entirely sure where I'm going. The, um, the, the nephew of the woman who saved my grandmother came to Israel for a Righteous Among the Nations ceremony to acknowledge his auntie that she's the reason we're all here. And I knew that they're coming in three days and if I'm not gonna shoot it, it's gonna be gone. So I just shoot those three days and then I almost kind of collapsed. It was a bit of a, a mini breakdown after three days of shooting my family and my father uh, will we'll go and we'll talk about it later. But my father was really afraid that I'm gonna kill my grandmother with making her talk about that. And it was very, very intense. And after those three days, I just put it aside and didn't touch it. And uh, a few months after I started a production company and uh, this girl that worked with me said, hey, why, what about the three days you shoot about your grandmother? Maybe you should do something with that. And I kind of went back to that and I started uh, looking at it and I realized actually the footage jab is pretty good. It's not only like a family family videos or something. It's actually really good um, quality. And then I started making the film and I think to a certain level, it felt like I want to take off the burden of, of her shoulders. But to be entirely honest, it's a burden that I always carried as well. So it wasn't only to take it off her shoulders, but almost somewhat of, of mine. Um, and I think it worked to that extent. Like I remember I was, she was 95 when I started filming the movie and I was really worried that she would not make it by the time the film is, is uh, finished. So we made a special screening for her um, a few months before it was aired on TV. And she was, she was in shock. She was sitting there in the premiere and she was like, she couldn't believe it's all for her. And, and after, for four years, she lived another five years after she died in, uh, when she was a hundred and a half. Um, so every Holocaust day I would come to her and we watched the film together and she watched herself and she would repeat the sentences that she say in the movie. And, and I, I did feel like it took a lot of her burden, definitely took some of my burden, made it much easier to live with that memory for me as well. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Now, we should get into later and just so the audience knows, Irit is trying to connect. So she'll <laughs> be back with us shortly, I'm sure. Um, but I can share some of the questions that we had reviewed together in advance. Um, we'll want to get into how the, the second generation members of your family responded to each of your, your films. But let me begin by asking how the survivors in your families responded. It sounds like they were sort of excited to participate. Um, and uh, Alexa, your um, grandmother was uh, around for several years to sort of see the, the reaction to the film as well, right? Yes. Um, and also they were not that excited to participate in the beginning mm. at all. Um, they were very resistant to participating, not only because you know, there's a basic issue of trust, especially when anything goes into the public, but also just um, they knew, or especially, you know, Bella knew that I would be asking really hard questions at some point, you know, there was a lot of cooking and lightness but I you know I also wanted to know what happened and similar you know uh, similar to Noah's experience and I think to many grandchildren of survivors experiences you know I think while our parents sort of knew to not ask if you know uh, for us we need to ask we needed to ask and and so it was really hard sometimes but they also kind of sometimes coquettishly, I think, we're like, why are people into this? Like, why, you know, are we that interesting? And then they wanted to hear like, yes, you're beautiful, you're interesting. And um, and the area they, they lived in, um, it's a, it's like, it's a, it's a Berlin sort of, you know, it's in the city and people would recognize them all the time on the street, you know, uh, and in the supermarket. And I think um, definitely made them feel a little famous. I mean, they were kind of famous in our, in the, in their neighborhood. So, um, yeah. 
Irit, welcome back. Um, Thank Noah, you. Just tell us how the, the survivors and her family responded to the film and uh, I'll log off and hand the floor back to Irit. Yeah, well, I, I only had one Thank survivor. You. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You know, I only had my grandmother surviving at that stage when my grandfather passed away when I was younger. And unfortunately, I don't know enough of his story, just bits and pieces. Um, but I, I think it, it gave her a lot of relief. And I think it, it, a bit like Alexa was describing, she was very happy to be famous, although she would never say that. But, uh, but she, she was really, she was like, oh, that's for me. For everyone is here to see me. And, and I'm, I'm the star. And my grandmother really liked to be modern. She always said, I need moderna. I, I'm, I'm modern, you know. I'm, um, but, uh, but I think it was, it was a very big thing for her. And I remember the, the, the contract with the channel was for four years to be aired. And in the fifth year, she was like, what about Oi Mama? They don't show Oi Mama. And then we discovered they aired it very late at night. So she still had her. Or thing, but I, I think it became like when I started working on a, on the film, uh, a friend told me that they'll see that um, when you make a film, in the end, the film becomes the story. So whatever goes into the film stays in the story and whatever doesn't go kind of, and I think it, it became, it became her story for her, for me. Uh, I'm not sure about my father all that much, but I'll wait for the next question, who is that part? So actually that would be my second, my next question is actually about the reaction of the second generation in your families to the idea of making the project and to the final product. Because in speaking about the second generation, I think Alexa, you are absolutely right. Um, you know, many second generation knew not to ask. Uh, many of those who did ask uh, knew what not to ask also. In my family, I was the youngest of three. My older sister and brother, my sister was born uh, right after my parents arrived in Palestine, which was immediately after the war and into the war of independence. Uh, and my brother shortly thereafter. And my father would say about them to people, I would hear him say, you know, they didn't ask, they, they, they didn't want to cause us pain. The little one, she didn't care. She wanted to know, you know, so there was a, but many of us had what is called the double wall. The parents didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want to transmit the, the, the atrocities and, and the stories. And the second generation didn't want to ask, as you said, but you asked, you went ahead and did this. How did your second generation respond to the idea. Um, Whoever wants to take it first, no? Uh, so, so my father basically, I, I kind of mentioned it. My father said, I'm killing her and I should stop doing that. And why do I insist to, to dig in all the pains and why, and you know, and why do I always put salt on his wounds? And it was like, it was against him and against my grandmother and against everyone. And by the time the film was almost done and I showed it to him, I was like, what about your grandfather? Your grandfather's story is not there. You should tell your grandfather's story as well. So, <laughs> so there was like just basically a lot, a lot of challenging what I was doing. And it, it was pretty scary because I didn't know how she would respond as well. I was kind of hoping it's going to give her some healing, but, but there was no way I could know. It was the first film I ever made. Um, the interesting thing was in the premiere, the first time you saw the full feature, the full film after it was finalized, he discovered for the first time, so my grandmother tells me, and it's something I always knew, I always asked my grandmother, and she was one of the survivors that always spoke. Uh, my grandfather didn't speak, my grandfather only said one sentence about the Holocaust, which was that after the Holocaust, he was like a bird that someone caught the end of his wings, and he could never feel as happy as he used to, and he could never feel as sad as he used to, and the, that was the only thing we knew about him. But my grandmother spoke a lot, and if I would have to guess, my father probably didn't want to hear it all. And I'm assuming that his sister, my aunt, was the only one that was willing to listen until I came. And I was always asking and always wanted to know. And uh, so I always knew that my, that my grandmother went, uh, had an abortion. She was in the ghetto and she got pregnant. And she said, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to give birth to a Jewish baby those days. And, uh, and she and her first husband, it wasn't my grandfather, um, they escaped the ghetto, went to this monastery where she had an abortion and she's telling, she tells about it in the movie how she was next to this uh, Nazi officer lady that was giving birth and he gave her diamonds and she was there freaked out that no one will know she was Jewish. So I always knew about that and it was very obvious to me and I never imagined that my father had no idea about it. And when we came out of the premiere, he said that he never knew that she had an abortion. And she as well, when I asked her in the movie, she says, should I say it? Like, 
you know, are you sure you want me to say it in public? So obviously it was somewhat of a secret, but like that's a good example of something that he had no idea that happened, which you know would obviously affect him more than me directly. He was supposed to have another brother or sister or whatever it is. Um, so, so I think in many ways the film gave him the story, some of the story that he'd never heard and probably didn't want to hear as well. I think in retrospect, he's probably pretty happy about that. But um, still, until today, he was very pleased when it was aired in TV and when people told him things about his mother and how amazing she is. And so, he, so he did enjoy that part. But I would say that until today, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised because for me, having this film, it's having her alive and, you know, have an ability to see her, to show her to my kids. I'm very keen on not passing the trauma, but letting them know my grandmother. And, um, and, and with them, I feel that they, they still are a bit hesitant. I think they're happy it's there, but like, I don't think anyone of them watched it again since the premiere, you know? So it's still kind of, it's, it's a good thing it's there. It's a good thing you did it. Get working on your grandfather's story, but, but you know, but don't force us to watch it again, basically. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I know a lot of people who have not watched their parents' testimonies on video, which were given whether in the context of the Spielberg project or the Yale archives or other places that did it, and their second generation child has not yet found the, the capacity to, to watch it. It's so I scary. I do have to say, um, my, in my undergrad, one of my uh, dissertation topic was analyzing my grandmother's Holocaust story. It was many years before the film and it was about the collective memory versus the personal memory and where do they kind of cross that and I remember then learning about the 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 result of bearing witness it's really hard you know so I I can definitely understand that especially when it it is your parents you know there was absolutely. one level of separation for us absolutely and indeed you you have been protected by another generation and your survivor grandparents are also, they were also at a very different life phase by the time that you were doing this and getting to know them than they were such a mm -hmm. short time after the end of the trauma when they were raising their children. So yeah. it's a completely different uh, time in their lives. And another very important aspect is the fact that the socio-cultural attitude to the Holocaust and to Holocaust survivors has changed very dramatically over the years. So sure. when we were growing up, it was something not to talk about. It was, you know, in America, the survivors were treated as the green nails. In Israel, they were also, there were all kinds yeah. of expressions and everybody basically wanted the second generation wanted to be Americans or Canadians or Sabres. Israelis, yeah. Be children of survivors. And, uh, and by the time you came around, I think the attitudes were very different with a lot more uh, respect and a lot more focus on the, um, on the resilience and the heroism of the survivors than on the victim and, and humiliation and, uh, and those aspects. Alexa, what was it like for your father, your, your Oma's son? Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I th the way I remember it is I think he kept out of me making the films. Uh, also, I think out of, honestly, respect for my studies. Um, he sort of was like, okay, you're doing this with your grandmother. Bella's son didn't want to be in the film at all. And my parents aren't really in the film. There's just one big Shabbat dinner where everybody's there. But Bella, Bella's son just, you know, he, he wasn't sure what this was going to be. And I think he was a bit scared. And I think, um, you know, after the film came out, um, you know, growing up in Germany, Jewish after the Holocaust, it really couldn't be more different than in Israel, of course. And Jews have experienced literally so much erasure in Germany because it was they were literally erased. But also, when you grow up there as a second or third generation, you uh, feel erasure uh, a lot all the time um, about what's not there anymore. And I think, you know, um, I think my dad and a lot of people in our little community were happy that, you know, there was something new Jewish um, and something that, you know, was really inviting for people to feel joy about among Jews and non-Jews. And I think it was just, um, I think my dad was really proud of his mom and, and, uh, and that we, you know, that this existed. Um, 
it's, it's, it's different in Israel where there are so many descendants of Holocaust survivors and, you know, it, it's just a really different thing. Absolutely. You know, I spent four and a half years in Hamburg um, when I did my PhD and I was working for the Israeli government there. And I totally can relate to this profound sense of erasure. I remember once going walking towards the university, the first time I actually went to meet the professor I was going to work with. And all of a sudden, my eyes caught this little sign at the, at the kind of square. And it was on the side and it said, on this square, the Jews yeah. of Hamburg were collected before going to the transports to the concentration camp. And I still thinking about it, I get all sort of uh, goosebumps because it was so horrifying yeah, to, to, to see this, uh, the realities juxtaposed in this way. But you know, the question uh, begs itself, right? From what you say, how do you understand Oma's decision to stay in Germany after the war? Yeah. I mean, that's a decision I, I wrestled with a lot in my life. I don't anymore because I really understand it now. I think, you know, also seeing other things that happen in the world today and movement of people and refugees, I, I really have to say that, like, choice is a privilege. And, um, you know, my grandmother and, and the people that stayed uh, you know, that stayed, basically they were brought, most of them were actually Polish Jews that were brought to Berlin as displaced persons and they were in these displaced person camps or people camps. And then um, from there, they got their visas to America or Canada or they went to Palestine and Israel. And I think, um, you know, in the case of my grandmother is in the case of a couple thousand others, it's like you lost your entire family or a view of one surviving sibling or cousin. And unless you all can go together somewhere, it's more important to, you know, stick together. And, um, you know, they were 19, 20 years old. They were really young. And in this, my dad was born in a, in a DP camp and the people they met in the DP camp very quickly became their new families and, and their new community. And the other thing, um, that I used to really judge morally, but now I, I get it as well, is the fact that, you know, as a Jew in Berlin, after the war, a divided city where the Americans are occupiers, Jews were able to move more free than really anybody else because of what had been done to them. And um, a lot of them really, I really can't say any different, just really did very well on the black markets and, and made well for themselves. And it was very easy to earn money. And, of course, with a massive moral price on it, right, is the fact like that they in the late 40s were able to sort of, you know, um, be busy, but, you know, until the day my grandmother died, she never had any non-Jewish friends. She was still friends with the people she was in the DP camp with, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, a great moral price on living in a place where, you think that everybody's your enemy. And, and that is, a, is an a, additional trauma on top of the trauma of the Holocaust that I feel Jews that stayed in Germany uh, had and gave to their children and grandchildren is an in intense, I mean, I think this is like a post, you, you know more about this, but like a post Holocaust, like everybody hates us and wants us dead attitude I'm sure exists everywhere among descendants of Holocaust survivors. I think in the case of Germany, it's a little bit specific just because it's Germany. But um, yeah. But I do have Absolutely. to add on that, you know, my grandmother that was Polish, she, when she realized that the Russians are taking over Poland, she escaped back to Germany, you know, it yeah. was like in the end of 45. And she said the Russians were the worst, like she was, you know, she preferred to go to move to Germany. She was not a German, you know, she was a Polish and she, she moved there and she was there in a displaced people's camp for two and a half years. So I think to a certain level, there was, you know, th there was uh, an, some sort of strange sense that maybe it's safer than other places at that stage. Yeah, I mean, my grandparents always vilified Polish people more than Germans. For them, it was the Poles and we never went to Poland <laughs> and we never yeah. allowed to go to Poland. But... Yeah. Um, 
and you know and then you know and then it's like do we go to israel but then there's a war in 48 and then it's like do we want to endure another war and they're scared you know it's just it was never a, it was never a real choice you know it 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 just sort of happened that way you know alexa what comes across very beautifully i think in the way that you speak about it and i think noah you you and i communicated about it and it also came across when you said you know when i became a parent when i reached 40 certain things change i think what also comes across from my clinical work from my research with the different generations is that for the third generation there is a real sort of also for the second but for the third definitely very much a certain evolution and change in the way that you view a lot of things as you age you know it was also true for the second generation but it's i find it even more so with the third that you get a different perspective like you say alexa i really struggled with it and now i understand it i see it differently i and Noah, you said the, about a few things, when I reached 40 or now that I am a parent, I see it differently. I think that's, uh, that's also something that we see, again, in empirical studies that people say that the meaning of the Holocaust and the understanding and the comprehension of it sort of matures with life, changes with life, especially for the third generation. And... Uh, I wanted to, you touched upon the moral issue, Alexa, you used the, the word, you know, moral or what we call today moral injury when we talk about people who endure all kinds of traumatic events from various directions. Your story, uh, your, your documentary, Noah, uh, touches upon something that I think is inevitable for any descendant of the Holocaust, and that's the question would I have done the same? Would I have managed to put the lives of my children and my partner at risk to save other people? And um, how do we struggle with that? How, did you, how do you find that this is part of your um, legacy? Me, yeah. Both of you. <laughs> yes, you, because, you know, uh, in your documentary, let me just say very quickly, in your documentary, you also included a very unique aspect of growing older in Israel, which is that a lot of older survivors had people from other countries, Filipinos, uh, in your grandma's case, someone from Peru, which, where she spent some years, um, take care of them in their homes as live-in aides. And in your grandma's case, she did something that I've never heard of. Her caretaker got pregnant and grandma living in an assisted living facility fought for the right for this woman to have her baby and raise the child in the assisted living mm -hmm. facility. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I really, I did ask my, my grandmother in the Philippines, she would have done what Stachawa, the Polish lady did to save her. And she very honest to say, well, I don't think so. You know, I love Magna. I'll, Magna was her, her caretaker. I love her. I'll do a lot for her. She did fought to allow Magna to have her, her only daughter. She, Magna was 42, I think, when she gave birth. So it was very obvious that it's her only child. And she did fought for her to be able to raise her in the elderly house. But, you know, it's, it's very easy when you live a comfortable life to fight for someone's ability to raise his child there. And I think for me, it's the classical, if you're a socialist when you're 20 and 30 and 40. So, so in my 20s, I was sure that if it would ever happen again, I'll be a furious fighter and I'll help everyone survive that. And it was very much a principle for me. And I did, like when I worked on the, on the movie, my grandmother made me promise to her that if she passes away, I'll make sure that Firita, the, the young child named after her, will be fine and she will be legal, legal in Israel. At the time, they weren't legal in Israel, but they are now. And for many years, I was taking, I was participating in the in this kind of a, a, a activ a activism against departing those children, and I, it was very important for me to fulfill my my grandmother's wish and make sure that they're safe. Um, but again, I didn't jeopardize anyone's life, and it, it, it's easier when you're a third generation Israeli, very used to being able to fight for whatever you want and and speak freely. And and I don't think it's the case now, but it was the case when I grew up. Um, 
so 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 it, it was it was a principle for me like for me the holocaust the one thing we should learn from the holocaust is to make sure people get good um, good equal uh, rights wherever they are whoever whoever they are and and Ferita, she's a 16 year old girl now she her family her parents uh, converted to judaism and they're orthodox she's not very orthodox but she's a 16 year old uh, girl living in israel now and um and she was, by the way, I just saw her a few weeks ago and she, before I left Israel and she said that it was really traumatizing for her when our grandmother passed away because she, you know, she turned from this kind of somewhat of a Jewish princess living really, really good life to a daughter of South American immigrants, um, Orthodox in an Orthodox community in Ranana. So it, it, it really changed her life and affected her a lot. But, um, um, but I do see with time, kind of that they get less and less involved unfortunately with with kind of activism and there are some causes that are really important for me and I definitely you know I definitely make a point of teaching my kids one of the reasons I, I moved with them now and decided not to raise them in Israel was because I want to teach them that all peoples are equal and all humans are equal and that we treat every person as a person regardless of what is religion or ethnicity or background um, but I do have to say that looking from now I would probably not jeopardize my family I'll do whatever I can to assist the people in need without jeopardizing my family but uh, but it's not as strong as it was in my 20s thank you Noah so you know I uh, have a friend who's not Jewish and not American. And, uh, and she said to me once with great confidence, of course, I would, I would certainly hide people if this happened. And I thought to myself, there is the difference between you and me as a second generation. For me, it's much more close to home. It's much more personal. It's much more real. And for me, therefore, it's much less obvious that of course I would do that. Not so yeah. sure. It's yeah. a huge thing, yeah. Alexa, yeah. Uh, I wanted to uh, perhaps uh, uh, start with you and maybe we can also have Noah add to it later. You touched upon Noah, the, what you want to transmit to your children. And since we want to open the discussion for questions and, and comments from the audience in five minutes, perhaps I will just uh, ask the two of you one more question that follows up on that. There is the concept in history, uh, research, and in, uh, and in psychology, especially in my field of intergenerational effects of historical trauma in various groups. There's the concept of a usable past. A usable past pertains to aspects of our family history, aspects of our ancestral history that we feel are very meaningful to us, to our identity, to how we see ourselves. These are aspects that we feel enrich our lives in the present, um, um, inform our values, and that these are aspects that we want to transmit forward to the next generations. So Noah, you spoke about a little bit about it in your answer. Alexa, what did you, what do you think about it? What do you think you wanted to capture in your documentary and, and in this way? Well, I think in terms of usable past, it's actually exactly to me the, the previous question. And I think, you know, in a way, I think it's too literal to think about, you know, would we hide people if this happened again? Because it gives us an excuse to not do anything right now when we see things, because, you know, I, I think it's impossible for anybody to know what they would do in that kind of situation. And I think the people that saved, like, like Noah's, the per people who saved yeah. Noah's grandmother. Right. And I, I highly doubt if you had asked them a couple of years earlier if they were going to save Jews, that they would have said yes. You know, it would probably just happen and felt right to them in that moment. And I, and I feel like, you know, we, we don't need to wait till awful things happen, really awful things happen, because I feel like in every society, certainly in Israel, and I live in the USA, I mean, I have a list this long. And I have little children as well. And I think I don't want to define my Judaism just by uh, only by the Holocaust or by feeling marginalized. You know, um, I think part of the privilege of the third generation is that we get to do something positive with our Judaism, especially, you know, I'm not, I'm a secular Jew. So 
for me, it's not really about religion, it's about culture and uh, it is about civil rights and it is about equal rights for all. So I think, um, and thankfully Judaism is a culture and religion that actually is very connected to helping others. And, and I feel like for me, what I'm gonna give my children is what can we do positively with our Jewishness, you know, what is, what can we, what kind of beauty can we create with it? And what can we give others with it? And I think what belongs to that, that it, it just truly, to me, can't just be about Jews at all, because it, it really is to me about all, all humans. And so I, I just feel like we don't need to wait to hide people. We can, we can do a lot now and we need to do a lot now, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I could not agree more with you. And I think, you know, there is the thing that's going around now with survivors. Um, it started with words, right? It didn't start with having to hide people at the cost of the lives of your exactly. own family. It starts with small things that each of us can do something about right now. And there's plenty to do, as you said, whether it's in the United States, in Canada, or in uh, anywhere, Israel, everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. So um, we only have another one minute. So I just wanted to say that in your documentary, Alexa, there is a, a lot of the recreation of the tastes of home, the tastes of childhood, which Oma and Bella didn't really even have a chance to learn to do, but they very intentionally found a way to learn it and you focus very much on it. I think that uh, to me at least, it was a very, very powerful metaphor for a usable past for mm. recreating something that I, I always said it to my children that I love creating the foods that my father told me his grandmother made because the thought that we are enjoying the same taste and smell that they did is such a, such a concrete connection. Is there, is there something you can tell me about why you chose to focus so much on the cooking? <laughs> Well, it's because of how I connected with them, you know, it, it, you know, even it, regardless of what we spoke about, if we just watched TV when I was at my grandmother's house or what we did, there would always be the same food. And I feel like it's how a lot of, in, in every, you know, specific culture and, and since Oman Bella came out, I, I feel like I've had so many other, like in America, like children and grandchildren of immigrants tell me the same as sort of they don't even speak the language anymore. They don't go to where they're from, but they still eat the food. It's sort of this, it's this thing that, you know, how culture can survive uh, yeah. when other elements of culture don't. And the thing that um, connects the generations. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of, you know, it's like Marcel Proust and the Madeleine. It's kind of the same thing. It's just like a smell or a taste can, can you know, bring memories in this really... And, you know, I, I make Jewish food now and I make it on the holidays or for my kids. And of course, not everything is like, I'm not trying to use it to sort of, you know, inject them with our history, but it, it should also just be this beautiful thing. And that's like a taste of home. And in my family, we, I, chicken soup is my favorite thing to make still. It's when I'm not feeling well, it is what I like to eat. Weird. and we, we yeah, yeah and we still we all do that <laughs> you know we all do that so mm -hmm. it's kind yeah. of um yeah I I think I think it's so important um yeah in terms yeah. of cultural what is it like cultural transference or something yeah so there's a term transmission yeah. yeah transmission yeah yeah so I just before stopping I do want to tell you that the warmth and the the glowing of the eyes that both of you show when you speak about your grandmothers is incredibly touching and that it is part of what we see in studies on large samples that the relationship between the third generation and the first is different from the second generation. A lot of the anger is not there. A lot mm -hmm. of the sense of the childhood that was overshadowed in some ways by the parents' pain is not there. There is a lot of pride, a lot of understanding, compassion, uh, and enjoyment, and a focus on the strengths and the resiliency that the grandparents uh, had. 
not only in the Holocaust, but throughout their lives. So thank you so much. And with that, I will open it to comments and questions from the audience. I could speak with you for a lot longer about it. It's fascinating. Thank you for these amazing documentaries, which I hope everybody will go watch after our program. Thank Ari, you. can you tell us a little bit about the questions or comments that you have received? Yes, but I'm just going to start with one from me because we, I know we, I believe we used to have an Oma and Bella cookbook in our museum shop, and I, I guess it's not available in the U.S. anymore. Alexa, can, is there any way we can get that? <laughs> No, it, it is. It's just um, because of COVID and I, you know, I distributed it myself and stuff. It's kind of like a little other operation that I run here in the US and it just became too complicated because I, I bring the books from Germany and stuff and with COVID, it, it just wasn't possible. So people can order them if they write me, which I know is an extra step. People still do that sometimes. I just don't have the automatic thing I do I still like via PayPal and then I'll send them whatever they want and, and you can still get them at certain stores in the U.S. Um, like an, at Omnivore in San Francisco that's a book like a cookbook shop they always reorder I'm not sure if the Jew Museum of Jewish Heritage ever reordered to be honest well we'll have to do that <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's take a question from from William he's asking for both of you Noah and Alexa um, what did it mean to your parents to grow up without grandparents. Um, was that something that they mm. thought about as central to their loss or is that not their framework? You go, Noah. I, I go. Um, from, uh, so my father actually had the only surviving person beside his parents was his grandmother, um, Fanny, which I'm named after. And uh, he always said that she had no sense of humor. So that's like the only thing I heard that she was really not funny. And sometimes I wonder if it's like, if it's part of the family or part of her history. Um, but, uh, but there was no, he, he never talked about, like he talked about the dead people living with them, about his uncle and his aunts and his, so, so they were always kind of existing as part of their life. Uh, but I don't think he talked about his specific loss, but there was, however, he was, uh, he was born in the refugee camp in Germany and the displaced people, uh, in Landsberg. And then they moved to Peru when he was two and a half years old. So the community in Peru was all Jewish Holocaust survivor descendants that had no family, moved to Peru and became their family. So until today, I would say that this small community that almost, I think all of them or most of them migrated to Israel later, but like my father arrived to Israel in 69, I think. So, so this community of, of Jewish Peruvian, I always laughed that they was brought up more Peruvian than Polish because like most of the food I ate besides the chicken soup and, and some other stuff was Peruvian food. So, so we grew up as a community of Holocaust survivors and, and there were uncle and auntie, although they were, you know, they were not uh, biologically. So, so I think it was definitely missing. I, I wonder sometimes when I see my father relations to my son, he, he loves them. Like I've never imagined my father would be, you know, so, so in love with any creature in the world. And when I see that, I wonder if it's some, some, somewhat of a compensation for what he never had. Um, but yeah, I think it's maybe one of those things that if you don't have, you don't know you're missing to a certain degree. Um, Alexa, what's your take on it? On the second generation and grandparents? Do you well, think that it was that they missed it? Oh, I'm sure they missed so much. I'm sure they grew up feeling so much loss and didn't know what to do with it at all. That's why they were so angry, I think. Um, and so, I mean, weirdly, my mom actually had grandparents. They survived. Mm -hmm because my, my mom's parents were in, in Russia during the war. And um, so she did grow up with grandparents, but my mom, and, and I think she's actually listening right now or watching, but um, she um, in Montreal, you know, she, she grew up with stories of, you know, how, my, how her grandfather was like a Polish national basically. And they were so privileged. And my grandmother had her own horse carriage in Poland and, and stuff like that in the war. And then I think my, my mother grew up with, a very depressed grandfather and I think a very depressed father and um, you know so I think even if she did have grandparents it was not was not like for us you know right right um, so I can tell you from my perspective in Israel I grew up in a in an environment where a lot of my parents friends were holocaust survivors 
And uh, basically almost nobody had their parents survive. So none of us second generation really had a grandparent. And there was one family where the grandmother survived because they fled to Siberia. And she was Oma to all of us. All of yes, us sorry. called her Oma. And all of us treated her like Oma and she treated us like our like grandchildren. And it was a treasure. It was an unbelievably important thing because I do remember kind of looking at some other people from other, let's say, Jewish ethnic groups where there were grandparents and thinking, gee, wow, you know, and, and, and studies uh, do show us actually that uh, in interviewing second generation uh, in research, it was one of the things that was very painful the absence of extended family and the uh, disconnection of the generational chain was very painful, was very missing. Yeah. Ari, any other thing? Yeah, we have a lot of good questions. I want to read this. Yeah, these are all so good. I'm just reading them myself. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. these are good. I want to read this one aloud from, from somebody in the audience who's a, who's a sec member of the second generation. My youngest son had immense respect for my parents, his grandparents, both Holocaust survivors. This seems to be bypassing me, and he seems to be angry with me for having elements of second generation trauma. He seems to want no evidence or reminders of our heritage from me. This hurts. Any ideas on how to bridge this chasm in our communication? It, all of you should feel welcome to answer. Irit, I wonder from your experience dealing with um, descended families how you might address this. So if I understood you correctly, because there was a little bit of a disconnect, so I lost a couple of uh, bites, sound bites. The, the third generation, the 3G, as we refer to them sometimes, uh, does not want to hear anything about the second generation's uh, experiences as second generation and about the Holocaust. Yeah, and it sounds like from this question it has some resentment um, towards the the, 2G for some of the trauma of being a 2G. Yeah, well, you know, uh, what I can tell you is that in terms of our research, we know that the burden of the effects transmitted is related to the level of uh, post-traumatic reactions that the survivors continue to suffer from and in turn that the second generation continue to suffer from from the perspective of the third generation. So let me explain myself better. There is a tremendous variability in the survivor generation and in the second generation and in the third generation. We're not all alike. Some people came out of the Holocaust with more um, uh, damaging post-traumatic reactions and sensitivities and symptoms. And some people came out with or, or uh, recuperated better and had less persistent post-traumatic symptoms and reactions. From the perspective of the next generation, the most important thing in terms of how uh, negatively they experience their relationship in the family and how uh, much of the burden they feel was transmitted onto them, the most important factor is that the level of persistent post-traumatic symptoms in their parents. And uh, many times when one feels that there was a lot of it, then there is, of course, this sense of anger and resentment that I mentioned briefly before. On the whole, there is more of it in the second generation towards their parents than we see on the whole in the third generation towards the second. So there's more a sense of resentment, of anger, of, of, a, of a childhood that was somehow um, overshadowed by the difficulties of the survivor parents. On the whole, there is less of it in the third generation towards the second generation. They feel that their family atmosphere was more emotionally expressive, that the, there was greater warmth and more encouragement of autonomy and independence on the whole. But there are definitely second generation individuals, parents who suffered more because their parents were more uh, post-traumatic. And then the third generation in those families suffered more 
and might have more bitterness, more resentment about it. And that's, of course, a very painful state of affairs. And I think that is what we are hearing in this, in this example. And I see quite a few of these examples, unfortunately. And as uh, one of the uh, colleagues of mine uh, put it in the conclusion to their research, uh, you know, the group by Dov Shmotkin and, and Amit Shrira from Israel and others, they, as they put it, it may take in many families more than three generations to mitigate the catastrophic effect of uh, an event like the Holocaust. May I add to that? My observation as a grandchild and child, I, I also think, I also think without, you know, I've often growing up been resentful uh, of, of my, of the second generation, um, not because, you know, on some level, the trauma that Holocaust survivors went through it it it, it, it explains the way they were, the way they, the way the way the way they were. And I think to like grandchildren, and also having old grandparents, a lot was always sort of justified by the Holocaust. And I think on some level, second generation that grew up in Israel or America, or Canada, or in my case, Germany or whatever, I think maybe there's less um, patience for using the Holocaust to justify behavior and attitudes. Because I feel like when you're a third generation, like I, you know, through my film or Noah, or like, you know, we, we're doing the work <laughs> sometimes feels like, and we, we, we struggle with anxiety and depression and we go see the psychologist and we are trying to do the work. And maybe it sometimes feels like the second generation is using growing up with their parents and their parents' trauma. I, like, I don't know many people my parents' age that have really been analyzed or been to therapy for being second generation, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that that maybe brings with it some resentment as a child as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that you're touching upon some very important points, um, but it is also a very different time, as I said, different era, different attitudes. Yeah. You know, when my when I was growing up, I do remember one family that sent her daughter, the mother sent her daughter to a therapist at the time, you know, and you couldn't really hide anything in Jerusalem of that time. Everybody knew your business. So everybody knew that the girl was going to a therapist and everybody basically thought that she must be really, really disordered and something really really wrong with her those were the attitudes of that time and the attitudes changed now we talk about ptsd as part of daily life you know there was no ptsd then yeah they didn't understand what they were being what they were dealing what they were being exposed to there was no going to the therapist unless you were really crazy so um, things have really changed. And in, a, in some ways, things change for the better. In some ways, not so much. But, but anybody uh, can still go, right? A second generation anybody can person still can go still and go. <laughs> anybody can still go. And I have to tell you, as a clinical psychologist who does yeah. a lot of work with the second generation, a lot of people do go to me and to my colleagues and I can see inordinate changes uh, right. in second generation because this is an incredible group of talented, resilient people who come from talented, resilient people. And, uh, and they make changes very amazingly, especially now kind of middle age brings with it some opportunities. We lose something that we had when we were young, but we also gain something and second generation make tremendous gains in therapy in middle age and beyond. Amazing. I'm gonna yeah. jump in and very unfortunately, I have to close the program because we've hit the hour mark and I wanna let everyone yes. go. We're so grateful to each of you, Irit, Alexa and Noah for joining us today and sharing some of your personal and professional perspectives on this. There's a lot more to, to get into. Uh, we will send a recording of today's discussion out via email tomorrow, along with links to watch Noah's film, Oi Mama, and Alexa's film, Oma and Bella, in full. 
um, and some other resources. And we hope you do explore them uh, and join us for all of our upcoming programs and events. <laughs> yeah, we deal Thank with you. trauma a lot in different ways. Um, and, I, and I hope we're dealing with it in ways that, that some of you in the audience with personal experiences are finding interesting and, and meaningful for you. Um, I'll plug also, just because it came up, we have a program on August 26th um, called Recipes Remembered, which is all a cookbook um, that re uh, reflects the, the recipes and memories of Holocaust survivors and the way that food is a, a vehicle for, for their stories. So I thought that was a beautiful connection to what Alexa said. You can yes. find that in all of our upcoming programs on our website. Thank you, um, Ari, for all your work on this program. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure working with you. And thank you, Alexa and Noah, for joining us. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Thank you, thank you everyone. Take thank care, you very everyone. much. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.